first lesson today comes from the Old Testament book of Isaiah. Isaiah is promising, is giving to the exiles God's promises. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom be like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to live in. If you refrain from trampling the Sabbath, from pursuing your own interests on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it, not going your own ways, serving your own interests, or pursuing your own affairs, then you shall take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride upon the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of your ancestor Jacob, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Word of God, word of life. Thanks. Stand as you're able for the gospel acclamation. for today is taken from the 13th chapter of the gospel according to St. Luke. Now Jesus was teaching in the synagogue on one Sabbath day and as he was teaching a woman appeared in the synagogue. She was quite bent over. She could not stand up straight because she had been afflicted with an ailment for 18 years. Jesus saw her and he called her to himself, and he said to the woman, Woman, you are free of your ailment. And he touched her, and she stood up straight and began to praise God. But the ruler of the synagogue was indignant. He kept saying to the people, There are six days on which you can do work, come back on one of those days to be healed, but not on the Sabbath. And Jesus replied, you hypocrites. I know that every one of you unties your donkey or your ox on the Sabbath and leads it to water. So then why shouldn't this daughter of Abraham, who has been bound by Satan for 18 long years, be healed of her affliction on the Sabbath? Well, when he said this, his opponents were put to shame. But the crowd, they rejoiced at all the wonderful things Jesus was doing. Word of God, word of life. You may be seated. We're having a few audio difficulties today. It's life as live church. Um, so apologies to those of you online. We can't feed that directly. So hopefully you can hear well 
and so we're just having to manage as best we can. But as I like to say, worship will be perfect only in heaven. Until then, we just do the best we can. So um, C.S. Lewis wrote a space trilogy called Out of the Silent Planet. If you're a sci-fi fan, I invite you to read all three volumes because it's a retelling of the salvation story in a science fiction genre. And the trilogy begins with a professor at Cambridge University in England called Dr. Elwin Ransom. And he's out for a walk one afternoon and he gets kidnapped. He gets kidnapped by two men, uh, a Mr. Divine and uh, a Dr. Weston. And Weston is this mad physicist who has this vision of conquering and colonizing other planets and extending the human race there. And so they kidnap Ransom, put him in their spaceship, and they went, go off to this uh, planet called Ma uh, Malacandra looking for gold. And as they travel through space to this planet, Ransom hears what their plan is. They're going to offer him as a human sacrifice to the creatures there on Malacandra and thereby gain their trust, trust and eventually betray them and then conquer them. Well, eventually they arrive at the planet, and when they do, um, it's much more beautiful than Ransom expected. Bright, beautiful, splendid in many ways. And they get off the spaceship, but they encounter this species on Malacandra called the Saurons. And the Saurons are flimsy, kind of wavy things that are three times the size of any person. And they look fearsome, and so the three of them scatter to escape the Saurons. And that's when Ransom makes his escape. And he runs in then to another species on that planet called the Rose. And the Rose look like otters, but they're endowed with speech and intelligence. And they speak a language called Old, Old Solar. And he picks it up quickly, their language. And he learns many things from them. And one of the things he learns is that in Old Solar, they have no word for evil. And that they call planet Earth the bent planet because it's under the, the sway of the bent one. And when he tells them, when Ransom tells them their plan to make him a sacrifice, they tell him that these two men are bent men. Now, I don't have time to tell you the rest of the trilogy. You're going to have to read that for yourself. But what intrigues me is that image. A bent planet comprised of bent people. Because I think that's a striking image for the fallenness of our world. We do live in a world that is bent, that's out of joint, where things don't mesh, where things are out of alignment. And at least for me, it's, that has seemed especially true in the last several years. So many things have happened that just seem out of kilter and bent and twisted. And then add to that on a personal level for many of you, things like tragic death, an untimely illness, a terrible accident, heartbreaking divorce, a wayward child or grandchild, and many other things. And we quickly see how our world and how our lives are often bent and twisted out of shape. And so because of that, Jesus came to unbend our lives and unbend the world. And we catch a glimpse of that in that story that you just heard of the woman in the synagogue Jesus was in the synagogue that day, and the place was packed, just like it was whenever Jesus preached in the synagogue. The men were in the front, the boys behind them, and yes, the women and girls along the outer wall. Jesus was teaching, everybody was listening, and as he was preaching, a woman walked in the back door. She looked elderly, although we don't know whether she was, because she had been bent over 
for 18 years. She had gone to doctor after doctor after doctor, but they couldn't do anything. She was told she just had to live with it. And so she walked in and tried to melt in against the back wall. But Jesus spotted her right away, and he called to her. And every eye in the synagogue turned and looked at her. And she looked to her left and to her right, hoping that Jesus was calling somebody else. But he called her again, and she knew it was her. And she froze, and she wondered to herself, why is he calling me? Is he going to shame me like so many others have? Is he going to tell me that God is punishing me and that's why I have this affliction? Is he going to fill me with guilt over something I didn't ask for? Why did I come this morning? I should have stayed home. But slowly she walked forward and the crowd parted for her and she came up and stood next to Jesus. Jesus stepped down from the platform and he looked into her eyes and he said, woman, you are free of your affliction. And then he put one hand on her back and the other, he took her hand and he slowly began to lift her up. And at first her eyes were filled with fear. What in the world is he doing? And then shock as she raised up. And finally joy. And she realized what had happened. And the tears began to run down her face and she dropped her cane. And from some place deep within, she began to laugh, laugh, laugh uproariously. And said, thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. Everyone in the crowd began to cheer and applaud and praise God too for the wonderful thing they had just seen. She praised God because he not only unbent her body, but he unbent her relationship to others. No longer would she have to endure those stares that she would often get the stairs that said, oh, you must have committed some terrible sin to have something like that happen to you. And Jesus also unbent her relationship to God. She didn't have to wonder anymore whether God was punishing her, whether she had done some terrible thing. Now she knew that God loved her. Jesus comes to do the same for us, to unbend our bodies, but also to unbend our relationships to each other when they are twisted and don't mesh, to unbend our relationship to God when it seems that God is at odds with us, to unbend our relationship to this beautiful creation. Jesus is in the business of unbending our lives and unbending the world. But not everybody was happy that morning in the synagogue. The leader of the synagogue was incensed. He kept saying, there are six days on which to do work. Come on one of those days and be healed. And Jesus said, you hypocrite, I know that all of you here on the Sabbath day untie your ox or your donkey and lead it to water. And if that's the case, why shouldn't this daughter of Abraham, who has been bound by Satan for 18 long years, be healed on the Sabbath day? It was the religious leader who stood in the way or tried to stand in the way of God's loving work. That's a cautionary tale for us. Sometimes it can be the most religious people 
who stand in the way of what God is trying to do in the world. This religious leader got so caught up in the laws and the rules and the traditions and the customs that he couldn't let God's love flourish that morning for that woman. Rules, laws, traditions, they can all be good things, but they can also be used to hold people down, to oppress them, to keep them from rising up to their full stature as a child of God. God forbid that that should ever be us, that we be the ones who get in the way of Jesus' loving work of unbending the world. But Jesus didn't back down. Jesus didn't say, I'm sorry. Jesus didn't unheal the woman and tell her to come back the next day. Jesus stood firm because he will do his loving work when he wants and where he wants and with whom he wants. And the question is, for you and I, are we with him or are we against him? as he does his work of unbending the world. Gerard Manley Hopkins was a Roman Catholic priest and poet in the 19th century, and his most famous poem is probably titled God's Grandeur. And it begins, the world is charged with the grandeur of God. And he mentions the ways in which we see that in so many ways in the world, and then he goes on to say, and yet at the same time it is smudged it is smeared by human presence and human fingerprints and human toils. And then at the end, he says, but nevertheless, the Holy Ghost broods over this bent world with warm breast and, ah, bright wings. The Holy Spirit broods over our bent world the Holy Spirit broods over our bent hearts. The Holy Spirit broods over our bent lives. The Holy Spirit broods over our bent homes. The Holy Spirit broods over our bent churches. The Holy Spirit broods over our bent schools. The Holy Spirit broods over our bent community. The Holy Spirit broods over our bent nation. The Holy Spirit broods over this bent world, and out of that brooding comes a divine unbending, unbending everything that needs to be made good and straight and true, making all things right, all things good, all things true, all things to mesh together again. And so this morning, I invite you I invite you to rejoice with that woman long ago in the synagogue who is standing straight and tall. Rejoice with her because Jesus is here with us now doing his holy work of unbending the world. Amen. Our song of the day is just a closer walk with thee. I invite you to stand as you're able as we sing that song. Thank you.
us profess our faith. We believe in you, O God, who spoke all life into being, author of heaven and earth, architect of time, quilter of the cosmos. You shape our bodies from the dust of the ground, and by your breath we are given life. We believe in you, O God, who became incarnate in Christ Jesus, the Word made flesh, truly divine and truly human. You lived among us to reveal your justice, died among us to break the bonds of sin and death, to bring abundant life. We believe in you, O God, who transforms us by the Holy Spirit, draws us into community, moves us to action, and inspires us to hope against hope. You breathe new life into a fallen world and equip us to proclaim the good news of resurrecting love. All thanks and praise to you, O God, our beginning and our end. Amen. Please be seated. Now I'll invite the ushers to uh, move through uh, the congregation. You can place your offering there and also any prayer cards that you've uh, written that we will pray then after our offertory today. I invite you now to join your minds and hearts in prayer to center yourself, to be attentive to the presence of the Holy Spirit. So let us pray. We thank you, Lord, for our Light of Christ family, for the love that we share, for the care that we have for one another and the fellowship. Bless Pastor Bruce, all our musicians, staff, and volunteers as we prepare to start a New Year programs. Sunday school, Bible studies, and outreach to bring God's light to one another. 
Lord, we ask that you be with all those who are struggling with rebuilding their lives after loss. Give comfort and help to those who've lost homes in natural disasters, jobs that have changed, loved ones that have died, situations in which they now feel abandoned or hurt. Give us open hearts and hands to help us reach out to those around us with love and compassion. Lord, in your mercy, we pray, O oh Lord, for your blessing on our strategic planning process as we seek to discern your will for us in the years ahead. And we thank you for your generosity to us, giving us blessing upon blessing and gift upon gift. Help us to be generous with all you've given us, with our time and talents and treasure, so that others may come to know your unbounded grace. Lord, in your mercy, Lord, we pray this day for all who feel weighed down by afflictions in body or mind or spirit. We ask that you bless us and especially our healing and wholeness ministry. We pray that you use us to be wounded healers, to help us to always turn to you for wholeness and healing. Lord, in your mercy. We pray this day, Lord, for my cousin, Mike Felt, as he begins treatment this week for his brain tumor. Bless him with the miracle of healing and strength in the days and weeks ahead. We pray for Jill Swing, for Eva Braun, who are not doing well. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for my son, Michael, who struggles with depression and anxiety. Ease my worries for him. Pray for Jesse Peterson that God heals her and restores her to health and that God provides for her the things she needs for her business to flourish, to care for her family. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for Heather Sinkle. We pray for a job for Jess who has MS and cannot do factory work. We pray for a runaway grandson who was found Going into chemical dependency, we pray that he cooperates with this and it works well. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for ourselves here at Light of Christ and for all the needs we have, and especially for those who are suffering in any way, in body or mind or spirit. And especially today, we lift up to you Sally Torfin as she recovers from surgery and for the Christian, Christensen family as they recover from their house fire. We also lift up to you all those we know and love who are in need of your healing grace. Lord, in your mercy. Finally, Lord, we give to you all those things that weigh most heavily upon our own minds and hearts. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. On the first Easter, Jesus appeared to his disciples, and the first thing he said to them was, Peace be with you. We are invited to give that same peace to one another. The peace of the Lord be with you. Please share the peace with one another.
Just a word of explanation about how we will do uh, communion today. Um, we'll have you come in on either side of the stand here. There are gluten-free wafers here if you need those. And then we'll have two sides, someone with bread, wine and juice in the tray, and then a basket on both sides. So come down either side, um, commune, and then you can return to your seats. Uh, we practice open communion here, which means we invite all of God's children here, um, all who believe and follow Jesus, you're welcome to come and commune at the Lord's table. This is his table, not ours, and so we welcome you uh, to commune with us, whether or not uh, you belong here as a member of Light of Christ, or whether you're Lutheran or any of that stuff. So please come and uh, share in this feast of love and grace and peace. We continue with the offertory prayer on page 10. I invite you to stand as you are able. Let us pray. Merciful God, you open wide your hand and satisfy the need of every living thing. You have set this feast before us. Open our hands to receive it. Open our hearts to embrace it. Open our lives to live it. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy God, you alone are holy. You alone are God. The universe declares your praise beyond the stars, beneath the seas, within each cell, with every breath. We praise you, O God. Generations bless your faithfulness through the water, by night and day, across the wilderness, out of exile, into the future. We bless you, O God. We give you thanks for your dear Son, at the heart of human life, near to those who suffer, beside the sinner, among the poor, with us now. We thank you, O God. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take indeed, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Remembering his love for us, on the way, at the table, and to the end, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We pray for the gift of your spirit in our gathering within this meal, among your people, throughout the world. Blessing, praise, and thanks to you, holy God, through Christ Jesus, by your Spirit in your church, without end. Amen. Let us pray with confidence in the words our Savior gave us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated as we prepare for communion.
may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace now and forever. Amen. We've been fed by our Lord to be his living, loving body in the world. And so please take note of the ways in which we're doing that. We are gearing up for a lot of things here now that school's about to start. So please take note of all the ways that you are invited to serve and to grow in your faith in uh, these coming months. And then the other thing that um, I just wanted to uh, draw your attention to, if you didn't see it driving in, um, we've taken the next step on our columbarium. So the niches and the face plates are there. Uh, the stonework hopefully will be done within the next month and then the landscaping uh, as well next month. So hopefully this fall we will be able to dedicate it. So we look forward to that um, as a witness to our hope of the resurrection, that that's what we live by, is that this life is only a prelude to the life that God intends us, a life better than anything we can imagine. And so our columbarium will be this wonderful visible symbol of our belief in resurrection to eternal life. Now I invite you to stand as you're able for our sending liturgies. You find it on page 14. Let us pray. Lord God, you have called your servants to ventures of which we cannot see the ending by paths as yet untrodden through perils unknown. Give us faith to go out with good courage, not knowing where we go, but only that your hand is leading us and your love supporting us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now go out into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the blessing of the Almighty and most merciful God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon us and remain with us now and forever. Amen. <laughs>